more folks can, if the folks in the back hear me okay? Good, good, thumbs up, okay, awesome. So welcome to Going Headless Without Losing Your Head, Strategies for Making Your First Decoupled Web App a Success. My name is Christina Diemer, I'm a UX developer at Alley, a full service agency that casts custom digital experiences for publishers, nonprofit institutions, museums, and brands. We are a 100% distributed team, and this picture was taken at one of our awesome annual teacher retreats. Ali is a WordPress VIP Google agency partner, and its clients have more than a billion page views per month across news, entertainment, and policy channels. Some of our clients include the New York Post, the Demo Post, and the Bookings Institution, along with the American Alliance for Museums and the Henry J. Tiger Family Foundation. And yes, we are hiring. Um, if you're interested, please see me afterwards or visit our website. And a little bit about me, my pronouns are she, her. I'm a career changer who spent the first dozen years of my professional life as a manager and fundraiser for arts organizations in Philly, um, like Opera Philadelphia and the Rosenbach Museum. I have a certificate in web design and development, and I'm passionate about mentorship and accessibility. I have two cats, Pickles and Luna. Pickles is the one with the gray cat on the top picture, and this is the second one. Um, and I enjoy reading and watching classic films. And I'm on Team Headless at Kelly. This is our team logo. So I spend nearly 100% of my time on Headless projects. And the first thing I want to do is put you at ease. If you're nervous or anxious that you won't get anything out of this talk because you don't really know what a headless web app is or why you should even build one or this is a tech conference, maybe sometimes you've made, made you feel like you don't belong here, um, please don't worry. You belong at this talk. This talk is heavier on concepts and high-level overviews and examples and approaches. And we're going to talk a little bit about architecture, and there are some technical diagrams and code snippets. But the goals of today's talk are to give you the resources, perspective, and confidence to begin your first headless project, or at least not fear any headless project in your future. So um, what's on your agenda for today? Well, we're going to do a quick intro to headless. We'll talk about the benefits and trade-offs, um, look at some headless projects in the wild, and then we'll talk about some specific facets of headless sites that will help you get into a headless state of mind. And then finally, we'll explore some learning and productivity concepts in a section I call on not losing your head. So now let's get started with a little headless 101. In case you're wondering what exactly you mean by a headless web application, here's a short definition that fits on a posted and it's relatively easy to remember. So when someone talks about a headless or decoupled application, that's where a front end, usually in JavaScript, gets its data from a CMS via a REST to API endpoint. So if we're comparing a headless CMS with a monolithic or traditional CMS, we have some, something that looks a little like this. So with a traditional or monolithic CMS, the front end, which is often called the head, is coupled tightly with the data layer and the content, such that the backend tooling, content editing, site design and templates are all tied together or coupled. And often this coupling is a feature, not a bug, and that the rigidity serves to lower the barrier of entry and frees up the user to focus on content. So an example of a traditional CMS is WordPress. It's the most popular CMS today with a 58% market share, and it powers nearly 34% of the internet. Um, WordPress's mission is to democratize publishing, and a couple system can help do that. So with a headless CMS, the front end is removed from the data and content layer. The CML becomes agnostic about presentation or the view, and it just serves as the data through an API or an application programming interface. APIs can sound complex, and they really can be, but what you need to know is that the tools that help connect one system to another. We're going to look at and talk about APIs throughout the talk. So if they seem a little fuzzy to you, just think. So in a headless project, there's a lot of flexibility on the front end. Your front end can be React, it can be in Vue, you can even use 
than an alleged JavaScript. You can also use a static site generator like Jekyll or Gatsby. What you choose matters in that it can affect performance, installability on different platforms, and developer velocity. And you have similar flexibility with your CMS. You can use a native headless CMS like Contentful or Sanity, or you can use a traditionally monolithic CMS that has an API like WordPress. Again, what you choose matters, but you have a lot of flexibility. So now that we know what headless architecture is, let's look at why you may want to choose headless. Headless offers some valuable benefits that have made it a popular choice um, today, and there are trade-offs. But when Hellas is the right solution for a project, the benefits can make it all worthwhile. Performance is often one of the first benefits um, mentioned when talking about Hellas. Since we're just using the CMS via the API, we have a very streamlined backend, and there's less to load, and again, you have the freedom to use front-end frameworks and libraries like React Review that can really improve speed. Flexibility is another benefit. When the data is not coupled with a templating system, it's easier to reorganize your content and your modular components that can be repurposed across different parts of the site or across even different channels. You can use the same data to build a website, an iOS app, a wearable. Your CMS can actually have multiple heads. A third benefit is the ability to create truly impressive user experiences. Headless sites make it easier to implement those awesome features that your users experienced on Facebook without your having to revamp the entire site. Of course, no single approach has all of the advantages. There are always trade-offs, and headless is no exception. With a monolithic CMS, you trade ease of use for flexibility, and when you're considering a headless site, it's prudent to be aware of the price you're paying. Because as they say, here be drivers. The price you pay for the speed, flexibility, and power of headless is increased complexity and responsibility. With a monolithic CMS, a number of decisions are made for you, but with headless, the weight of those decisions shifts to your shoulders. You have to answer questions regarding how to handle your front end. What's your SEO strategy? Maybe you heard that search engines can't call headless sites. What's your plan for deployment? How will you handle workflow? How will you manage APIs? And what sort of design system will you put in place now that that decision isn't made for you? And you may feel like you've gone from driving an automatic to driving a station. So given the complexity and responsibility of going headless, it can be helpful to be mindful of which projects are good candidates for headless, and in what cases choosing headless can be worthwhile. It's easy to say it depends. And it truly does depend on the requirements, processes, and goals of the project, as well as the skills and experience of the dev team, which sometimes can be a team of one. An approach to take is to consider what projects are best positioned to take advantage of the benefits, the flexibility, speed, and breakthrough user experiences that Headless has to offer. Some dimensions of the project you may want to consider are type, content, size, topic, and editorial needs. By editorial needs, I mean the size and expertise of the content creators. Will one or two members of the client team create, edit, monitor, and publish content? Or is the content creation team a large group of users who need various permissions and individualized workflows? Most traditional blogs, brochure sites, and portfolio sites have their needs met well by a monolithic CMS or even just a static site generator. And if the content is relatively static, doesn't change very frequently, and the traffic isn't particularly heavy, you may not gain a lot by going headless. Use cases where headless benefits can be realized in meaningful ways include sites where the content is not simple. It's dynamic, there's lots of it, media rich or complex in other ways, where traffic is particularly intense such that performance is a priority, the project includes features that demand use of things like a virtual DOM, where aspects of the page change without the page reloading. Headless can also handle sophisticated editorial workflows, 
And if you have a non-traditional project where the only use of the CMS is the admin interface for updating content, headless can be a good option. So let's look at some headless sites in the wild. The first project is Colorado Public Radio. I was part of the team at Alley that built the new CPR.org, which launched on July 1st. The project included a redesign, rebuild, and a migration from Drupal to WordPress. As, a sta as the statewide radio network that's accessible to 80% of all Coloradans, Colorado Public Radio's website is media intense, featuring not only text and video, but also live streaming audio across three distinct channels. Definitely a media-rich site that can benefit from Headless's performance and flexibility. One of the exciting features on this site is a, pers is a persistent audio player that stays with the user as they navigate the site. So here on the homepage, we're listening to the CPR classical station, and you can see the audio player on the bottom of the report in orange. Um, we're, and it's, we're listening to a piece by Stravinsky. When we navigate to the arts page, the audio player stays with us, sticking to the bottom of the viewport. With a traditional implementation, the audio player would be in a separate window or some other nonsense. But using a React-based front end allows us to create this kind of breakthrough user experience. So this is a good place to pause and talk about Ali's application for a headless CMS, Irving. Irving is named after Washington Irving, the author of the famous Gothic story, The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. This story includes in its set of characters, the Headless Horseman. So Irving, the Headless Ecosystem, not the author, is designed for complex headless projects. We've been using it at Alley for over a year now, beta testing it on enterprise level content. And it's open source, so you can go to Ali's GitHub repo to check it out. And we just added lots of new docs. So the Irving system includes a number of packages, design and development patterns, and a fancy component library that all work together to create a very powerful ecosystem. And I'm going to talk about just two pieces of the Irving puzzle. I'm going to talk about the front end framework, Irving Core and a plugin that extends the WordPress REST API. We'll talk about the plugin a little later when we talk about endpoints. Um, WP Irving works with the Components API, and if you use the Components API without using WordPress, this is just an example. So Irving Core is the star of the show. And what the heck is Irving Core? Well, it's a React-based, front-end application designed for enterprise-level projects, particularly publishers, sites with a lot of content. Um, in a nutshell, it takes a string of JSON components and hydrates React components. Earning Core makes a request to the API passing along the routed data, which keeps the business logic and the CMS for the data layer, which gives us lightweight rendering and output. Irving also comes with isomorphic rendering. And isomorphic rendering is pretty cool. So isomorphic rendering is where the rendering happens on both the client side and the server side. The initial rendering happens on the server side, and subsequent renders occur on the client side. There's sort of a crazy chart. So with Irving, on the first request, the server side pre-renders the Redux state to prevent it from needing to fetch data on the client side on initial load, and it pre-renders the React component tree, preventing the need for complete re-renders on subsequent navigations. And that adds up to faster initial page load times. Client side rendering is a little slower on initial page load because it requires more round trips to the server, however, it's very fast on subsequent requests. So with isomorphic rendering, we get the best of both worlds server-side rendering on initial requests, and client-side on subsequent requests. A common concern about headless sites is that search engines can crawl or rank them because crawlers only see the static HTML on a page before headless sites that can look like an empty shell. 
However, since all the way back from 2014, Googlebot, Google's search engine crawler, has been able to render JavaScript before it starts calling sites. But somehow still the sort of rumor that um, search engines can't call how the sites remain. Um, even still, your mileage may vary because Googlebot isn't perfect, so using server-side rendering on initial load smooths out those wrinkles. Even if you use isomorphic rendering, though, that doesn't mean that you don't need a comprehensive SEO strategy that involves things like SEO friendly URLs, proper meta tags, and if needed, a well-formatted site. So another example of a headless site made with Fortune, made with Irving, is Fortune.com, home of Fortune magazine. So I was part of the team at Alley that built this new site, which also launched on July 1st. This was a rebuild of the site coming with the sale of Fortune to an independent owner. So Fortune's a very large site and a complex site with many content types, many third-party integrations, tens and tens and thousands of posts, and very high traffic. So performance um, was a very um, important priority for them. Some immediate outcomes of the rebuild were a 12% decrease in bounce rates and a 60% decrease in page full times, which is pretty cool. Other interesting aspects of the project worth noting were that on the DevOps side, um, the backends hosted on Automatic's streamlined VIP Go platform and the front ends hosted on their Node.js offering. One of the complexities of headless sites is that you have two systems to deploy. So another interesting aspect of Fortune is that, that it gave us the opportunity to incorporate asynchronous data loading into Irving. Asynchronous data loading allows data to be loaded to the page without disrupting other processes. There are certain processes like loading JavaScript and CSS resources that block the creation of the DOM, and loading data asynchronously allows the browser to continue working while data are being loaded. In Fortune, we used a React higher order component to handle the async data loading for search pages on Fortune rankings. You know, things like um, the Fortune 500, Fortune 40 under 40, the Global 500, where there are very extensive queries. And the cool thing about putting this into Urban Core is that it means that a feature that we built for Fortune can now benefit future projects. I'm going to offer a third example as a counterpoint to the larger sites like CPR and Fortune. This is the West Philly History Map, which I built back in 2016, and I was the sole developer for this little project. The map is um, a project of two grassroots community organizations in Philly, the People's Emergency Center and the Islamic Cultural Preservation and Information Council. The map highlights areas of cultural significance in West Philly. If the data points on the map had been static, could have, they could have just all been compiled into a GeoJSON file, and there wouldn't be any for a CMS at all. But in this case, the data was crowdsourced um, in a series of programs over many months, and then entered um, by a few different staff members into WordPress. To access the map data points, we used an early version of the WordPress REST API and the front end is just vanilla JavaScript with jQuery as well as the Mapbox API and the leaflet library. So while our two Irving sites had a more complex structure, the map is more of a traditional single page application. No fancy server side rendering, everything including initial page load is just happening, it's just being rendered on the client side. We're just getting the resources that we need from the API, parsing that data in JavaScript, and just rendering everything via an SBA templating tool or through the mapping libraries. So you can see that headless projects are not stri strictly the domain of enterprise level media sites. If you're considering going headless for a small site because it makes sense given the details of the project, go for it. Whether you want to render the, the entire thing client side as a single page application, you want to create something isomorphic you want to be crazy and have a, have a stack that includes Gatsby and WordPress or Gatsby and Contentful or there's just the sort of sky's the limit here. Um, and I, um, I will tweet out a link to a resources page that includes some 
great information about all of the different um, CMSs and um, and the front end tools that are available for Headless after this talk is over. Um, and I want to remind you that you can start small and add as many features as you want to over time. And now I'm going to talk about three seemingly separate issues around Headless that will help you get into um, what I call a headless state of mind. And they'll help you adjust to what may be a totally different approach to building a website. The first of these is workflow. When you're doing a discovery for a project for which you're considering headless architecture, you want to consider the characteristics of the project as well as the makeup of your team. I talked about which aspects of a project to consider things like traffic and content. When it comes to taking a look at your team, which again may just involve you're looking in the mirror, it's important to do a bit of a skills audit to determine if the team is prepared to create a headless site or if any additional professional development is needed based on your particular headless stack. Many people say that an advantage of headless is that it can allow efficiency through specialization. Back-end devs and front-end devs can each focus on your strengths. And you could build a headless site with the two working in isolation but I want to challenge you to go into the opposite direction. It's a more effective practice over the long run to divide work into vertical slices, where a ticket includes whatever changes to each layer are needed, such that progress is realized. That approach requires team members to be cross-functional. But the expectation is not that every developer on Team Headless is full stack. Rather, at LA, we did talk a lot about the value of becoming T-shaped. The concept of T-shaped employees was popularized by Tim Brown, the CEO of IDEO, and it's a departure from old concepts of tech workers where I-shaped employees, that is folks with one specialized skill set, no value. T-shaped employees, on the other hand, have deep knowledge in some areas, but also have the desire and ability to build skills across disciplines. The horizontal bar of the T represents breadth of knowledge, while the vertical stem represents depth. Where this comes into play on headless projects is that having a team of T-shaped folks who possess broad knowledge and a range of skills facilitates decision making and helps team members share ownership of the project. It increases velocity by removing bottlenecks and that often more than one person can work on a team. Also, in my experience, Working on a team with T-shaped folks where people resist silos and enjoy collaboration is also just a lot more fun. And from the perspective of an individual contributor, being T-shaped also has real relevance. And that's because headless projects have multiple code bases, one for the front end and one for the back end. So here are the two fortune repos. So often a vertical slice of work cuts through both code bases. A helpful way of dealing with that is to configure your editor to reflect that vertical slice approach. There are three aspects of this screen that reflect that I'm working in a vertical slice. The first is that I'm using VS Code's workspace settings so that I can easily open files in the relevant directories for a project. So in this case, my Fortune workspace includes the directories that correspond to both of the Git repos we saw earlier. The front end is Fortune Irving, um, and Fortune is just the back end. The second is that I have both back end and front end files open. So here I have a PHP file and a JavaScript file open at once. This could be taxing because it involves context switching, and PHP is not in the long part of my T but I appreciate the opportunity to work on the short sides of my team and context switching is diminished because the work, the front end and the back end are united by the vertical slice of work. I also like working in vertical slices because if I'm building the back end of a component, um, it means that I can have more control over what I'm doing on the front end. Um, and so I, if I need to make a change to what my API is, to what my endpoint um, looks like, and I'm building the, the back end for that component, I can adjust what is rendered to the, to the API. So I also like it because it gives me more control. 
And since I make use of VS Code's integrated terminals, I can make commits to each repo as needed without having to leave the screen. And considering the practical workflow of a headless project can help you adjust to the reality of what may be a totally different approach to building a website. Another aspect to consider is how you're thinking about your API endpoints. API endpoints are a source of truth for headless sites. They're a core interaction point, but not all API endpoints are the same. So let's again compare my mapping project with the two urban projects. The mapping project uses the WordPress REST API out of the box, and, but no matter where your API is coming from, studying the shape the endpoints can take is valuable. With the WordPress REST API out of the box, when you hit an endpoint for a post or a group of posts, the data returned to that endpoint is simply the resource you call. If you call a post, you get that post. You don't get global components like a header or footer, you don't get sidebar widgets, ads, anything, you just get the resources that you call. And that's pretty common for an API. So the primary API call for the mapping project gets a collection of all the points on the map which are our custom post type. This is what the API returns. It's just a big JSON object. All of the other aspects of the site, the attract screen when you first go to the site, map controls, etc., those are all rendered by other things. So the lesson here is that the REST API gives you access to resources, whether it's a post, a collection of posts, or other data. And sometimes that's perfect. That's exactly what you need. If you just need to get all of the posts with a, specific, oh, with a specific tag or category, that's fine. If you're using something like the Spotify API and you just want to get all of the albums by a specific artist, that's fine. But sometimes that's not enough. A challenge with a lot of APIs out of the box is that they have a lot of perks and gotchas. Um, for example, with the REST API, it references things like terms and images by IDs. So you have to make subsequent calls maybe to get the exact image data you need, and that can get expensive very quickly. So the small mapping project has three different calls to the rest of the API, and one of them is just about image data. Again, you'll find those perks in just about every API. So the options for more advanced work with the API include crafting custom endpoints, using GraphQL, which is a query language for API, and that's just a whole other talk. Or to extend the API itself. And again, every API you work with will have its own sort of advanced options, and it can be really valuable to read the docs and know what opportunities you have. So the WP Irving plugin I mentioned earlier when introducing Irving is an extension of the REST API. Some very smart people at Alley built the plugin which serves as a backend companion to the Urban framework. And a distinctive characteristic of it is that it works with the components API, which is another part of Urban, um, such that every API request returns an array of component objects which describe the components, their positions, and its state. The structure of the API mirrors a React component tree. So what you see with an endpoint is everything you need from the head on down to create a page. And again, that structure of the endpoint mimics the component-based structure of the Irving framework on the front end. The Irving application gets the data it does need and isn't burdened with any data it doesn't need. An example of that is a content item on the home page of Fortune. This is just part of the endpoint, but it's a real endpoint. So here in our endpoint, we have a component with the name of content item. This is the name used by um, Irving to figure out which React component to render. And the fig is an object of properties that get passed into that React component as props. Children is an array of other components nested in our content item. These will be parsed as components and available as nested. And every um, component in Urbane has that same structure. Name, config, children. And so here we have the front end 
React component in Urban. You can see the name of our component in React matches the name of the module themes. And there's just a lot of themes on this content I know. Um, and then the properties of our config object are passed down as props. And we're also getting our children components that are nested within our content item. And I find that this one-to-one -one match between the API and the front end makes everything from writing components to diagnosing bugs more straightforward and it really sort of fun. So let's continue to talk about components and component-based structures. Headless sites allow you to shift your approach to design from a templating system to a modular design system based on versatile and reusable web components. Modular design can reduce redundancy and promote consistency. I've also found that modular design is easier to maintain. So the home page of Fortune is a good example of modular component-based design. It's built with a series of customizable modules. Editors can select the type of content they want to include, and the appropriate content will be backfilled in. I think it's important to mention that each one of these, the content slot in this module, is the same content item component we were looking at earlier, just with those different um, CSS module themes applied. So Brad Frost's Atomic Design is a popular example of a modular design system. If you search for Brad Frost or Atomic Design, his work will come up. He organizes design into several layers based on concepts from and atoms are the smallest level of functional unit. So in our example, there are things like images, titles, subtitles, excerpts. And the next is the molecule. So here that's the content item. So the atoms of an image and a title, here they form a content item molecule. The next level up is an organism which forms a standalone section of an interface. Each section of the module is an organism, so even though the middle section is a list with one item, I think I might still call it an organism. And I think it may be breaking the rules a little bit, but I think the module itself is an organism. And the chemistry analogy breaks down a little after that, and I encourage you um, to read more of Brad's work directly if you're not familiar with it already. The important thing here is to, to identify these patterns in your project and structure your work around those patterns. And making those shifts in the way that you think about a project, working in vertical slices, remembering that endpoints are a source of truth, and formulating layouts in terms of components, not templates, will help you get closer to climbing to the top of Mount Headless. But this talk is called Going Headless Without Losing Your Head. And there are a couple of learning strategies that may help you keep your head, not only when you're learning um, a new system like Irving or a new headless stack, but just in general. So the goal of these strategies are to help with concentration, memory retention, creativity, and problem solving. So one of the first things that you can do to keep your head is to get out of your head and talk to people. Ask for help or advice. Ask questions. Pair a program. Swarm with your team on a problem. Two internal barriers to asking for help are fear and pride. The two are not mutually exclusive. Asking for help may force you to question your own abilities, and you may be concerned that you'll be seen as weak or incompetent. You may fear that asking for help means that you don't belong on the team or that you're not a real developer. And it may feel good to do it all on your own. You may attach excessive significance to doing it all by yourself, without anybody's help. The reality is that asking for help is an act of courage and strength. Utilizing resources that can unlock you is smart and efficient. Asking for help also models positive behavior to your teammates. Because there will be times when they need help, and your vulnerability in asking for help will help encourage them to be brave too. And it might turn out that your teammates have the same questions that you have, so wearing your ignorance on your sleeve 
can definitely be a public service. The second thing you can do to accelerate your learning and become more creative and productive is to leverage the power of small wins. Researchers at Harvard Business School who study the performance of people doing complex work inside organizations found that in terms of things that can boost emotions, perceptions of your work day, and motivations, the single most important is making progress in meaningful work. And the more frequently people experience that sense of progress, the more likely they are to be creatively productive in the long run. And they call this the progress principle. So whether you're architecting an entire of a site, building your first component, even a small win can make a difference in how you feel right now and how you perform over the long run. So set yourself up for success by identifying opportunities to make positive progress to keep moving forward. And this is connected to the previous point because the benefits of making progress, of being unblocked, are so great that they're worth the vulnerability of asking for help. Taking a break is a counterintuitive approach for increasing productivity and memory retention. But believe me, it's an excuse. And it's an effective intervention, especially when things aren't going well. Fixating on a particular problem when you're learning something new can be tempting, and we just talked about the importance of making progress, but sometimes you get stuck, even in the process of going for that small win. A healthy response to being blocked can be to take a break by going for a walk or getting some sleep. Some of the most skilled programmers I know are self-aware enough to know when they're encountering diminishing returns and it's time to back away from the keyboard. And there's plenty of science to encourage that response. Scientists at Stanford found that people can be up to 60% more creative after walking. It doesn't have to be a long walk. Somewhere between 5 and 16 minutes is the sweet spot for most people. The study author said that walking seems to free up the flow of new ideas. It may be that other benefits of the walk Reducing stress, improving memory, <coughs> focus, and concentration. But those things work together to prevent you from fixating on wrong ideas and help surface new ideas. And I want people to interpret walk broadly, as not everyone can walk. Just get out of your workspace and get a change of scenery. Another option, believe it or not, is sleep. I think a lot of us can relate to this tweet by Ben Hall a developer who's done some really awesome work with you, where he ignores his brain's desire for sleep because he's trying to work through a problem. There are several benefits to sleeping on it. A study by the National Institute of Health showed that taking a 60 to 90 minute nap was more effective at improving the brain performance than 200 milligrams of caffeine, which is like two shots of espresso. And a study at UC San Diego showed that REM sleep improves creative problem solving by simulating associative networks, allowing the brain to make fresh connections between seemingly unrelated ideas. And a study at Harvard Medical School suggests that dreaming may help the brain recognize and reorganize recently learned material, improving memory and performance. So as you're getting to know how those web apps, including their multiple code bases, API endpoints, in modular design, remember to reach out to others, leverage the small wins, and take time to rest. I've talked a lot of I've talked about a lot of things today, and I know it's hard to absorb or take in everything, so I'll tweet out a link to my slides, and again I will post a link to resources, including links to the Urban Framework um, on my blog and on Twitter. And I hope you'll keep me posted on your progress with your first Headless project using the hashtag HeadlessHeroes. So thank you for choosing to spend time with me today. I hope you found it useful and productive. <coughs> Usually I answer questions after a talk, but I'm just going to let everybody go to lunch. There's already like a line. Um, <laughs> so if you have any questions, I'm just going to hang around um, next to the stage afterwards. Thank you. Thank you.